Hello and a warm welcome from the pop-up studio of the German Ministry for Food and Agriculture here in Berlin. It's wonderful, ladies and gentlemen, that you have joined us on your devices, whatever they may be, and you're going to join us also in the debate in the next three days on uh, the importance on a healthy and sustainable school nutrition. Uh, you may or may not know that uh, the uh, uh, policies uh, against hunger conferences have a long history. Uh, they've actually been organized by the ministry since 2003. And this year, it is uh, the question of uh, the uh, most important issue, that is uh, the question of how do we feed our children around the globe? And basically, that is, of course, happening in schools. Now, this year, of course, uh, it's a good good year for food and agriculture and the concentration on that simply because there's also the big UN food systems conference that's going to happen in September in New York. But the Policies Against Hunger Conference has been one that has been established, as I said, uh, for a number of years now. And uh, the intention is actually the same, moving hunger and malnutrition into the spotlight of international discussions on food security. And uh, the motto of this year is very, very important uh, because it covers an issue that has not always been in the spotlight. This year we're going to talk about the Joint Action for Healthy and sustainable school nutrition. We know that malnutrition is especially, uh, is especially rampant uh, for children and for women, and that burning issue has to be tackled, and uh, especially in COVID-19 times, ladies and gentlemen, uh, that has been a particularly uh, bad and burning issue, and uh, you all know that, and you will find that in the discussions of the next three days, it's going to be a uh, subject that we're going to tackle all the time. Now, having put the spotlight on the previous uh, neglection of the issue, we are now going to talk uh, about a number of things. And everybody knows where do you get kids, where do you get young adults, uh, you get them at school. And that's exactly where you can improve their diets and uh, you also need an integrated approach of health, education, water and hygiene so that there is no silo thinking. Again, that's going to be an issue we're going to be discussing in the next couple of days. Now, COVID-19 and the way of recovery, this question means that it is incredibly important. Now, what works, what has worked up to now, what doesn't, of course, you can learn from that, and who needs to be on board in order to provide a satisfying solution. So we're going to focus on politics. We're going to focus on quality standards, nutrition education, local procurement, and different actors that can make the whole system work. We will hear from highly regarded experts and practitioners in their field. That's going to happen in the panel discussion in a moment. And of course, uh, there's going to be a big section of working groups that's going to happen this afternoon and tomorrow. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we are in uh, probably month 16 of COVID-19. You've done many, many conferences online, and yet each and every system has its sort of special um, aspects. So uh, just for you to know, this is relatively easy. All you need to know is that beyond the stream window that you can actually see, you have a choice of languages, and you can listen to us in the kind of language that you would like to have. And then, of course, you can participate and you can sort of uh, send us in questions, um, you can put in um, your statements and that's relatively easy. The chat box is on the right hand side. Only, however, if you put your questions in English, can we actually consider them? And we'll try and get as many of your questions into the panel discussion, depending on time, of course. Now, having uh, given you a long speech by now, we are now in the position of saying the opening session is starting and the opening speeches. And of course, it's going to be the lady at the helm of the Ministry for Food and Agriculture, Julia Klöckner, who is going to do the opening Words. Sehr geehrte Damen und Herren, herzlich willkommen zu unserer Konferenz.
Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our Policies Against Hunger Conference, which has been established, was established 20 years ago. The focus is always the human right on adequate food. We want to draw attention to the issues of hunger and malnutrition with our conference series. We, each year we focus on different focus areas. This year it's school food and nutrition. Why? Because we want to put the children of the world in the spotlight, because preschools and schools are the places where we can reach the majority of children in many countries. They are key points of departure for permanently improving the food situation in preschools and schools and for children and curbing hunger and malnutrition because there is a clear need for action. On the one hand, we have countries such as Germany where excess weight and overeating are problems, key problems, and we therefore launched the National Action Plan INFORM German National Initiative for Healthy Diets and Physical Activity in 2008. It also covers preschools and schools. Besides health-promoting aspects, we focus on environmental and climate stewardship factors. A healthy diet and a sustainable lifestyle, that is intrinsically linked. At the same time, we face extreme problems in large parts of our world. Roughly 74 million children are going to bed hungry around the globe and more than 144 million children have stunted growth due to chronic undernutrition. 47 million children suffer from acute undernutrition, with, which impacts their entire development. And the pandemic has exacerbated these problems in many parts of the world. Because, after all, school meals are for many children the only food they get per day. The pandemic has left roughly 370 million children without access to school, to school meals. This clearly shows if we want to take the right to adequate food seriously, especially with a view to children and our future, we must join forces to promote one thing at international level too, regular school feeding. That is why it is a good thing that the World Food Programme of the United Nations has been working towards establishing a coalition for school feeding. I would like to thank the Executive Director David Beasley most warmly for this. This coalition ties in well with the United Nations Food Systems Summit, which is to take place in September, because it basically aims at three aspects. First, reintroducing school feeding programs, which have been stopped or restricted due to the pandemic. And secondly, increasing the scope of school feeding programs, especially in lower income countries. And thirdly, generally improving the quality of school feeding programs globally. These are three aspects which are to primarily ensure that millions of children regain access to school meals. And these are key priorities that we too are committed to. In 2019, we therefore announced the establishment of a global net action network for pro the promotion of healthy, sustainable school food and nutrition. Experts from national governments are involved, and we are delighted that this initiative will now be integrated in the Coalition for School Feeding. We want to build up a network of countries and exchange, enable the exchange of experiences. Our objectives can only be achieved if we pool our activities at the international level. The coalition is therefore a suitable tool to this end because it will bring to the table stakeholders of international organizations, national governments, science and civil society. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted that we, Germany, contribute to this initiative. And I was particularly delighted about the invitation to become a member of the high-level steering committee. I am happy to accept this invitation and look forward to our cooperation. Our conference wants to make an active contribution to the decade of action of nutrition. We want to succeed at providing more children in schools with food, and we want to improve the quality of food. I would therefore be delighted if we could seize the opportunity of this conference today to go one step further, also with a view to the Food Systems Summit of the United Nations in September, which is to incorporate the results of the next few days. And I wish all participants of this conference fruitful discussions, best of success, and all the best for you. Thank you.
Buckner, and fighting hunger and supporting partner countries all around the globe uh, is not just uh, the ambition and the work uh, done by the Ministry for Food and Agriculture. Uh, there's also another ministry that is uh, engaged and involved, and that's the Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development. In fact, that ministry has had a program uh, for the last couple of years, One World Without Hunger. And therefore, we are very happy to have now and to hear now the Minister for Economic Cooperation and Development, Dr. Gerd Müller. Sehr geehrte Frau Bundesministerin, Federal Minister Klöckner, die Julia, gegen Hunger in Policy against Hunger worldwide brings us all together at a very personal level. I would like to thank everyone, all of the guests who are participating in today's event and thus highlight the importance of this topic. It is, after all, the United Nations SDG number one, a world without hunger, a world in which we can reduce poverty. And this time it is about children in particular. Well, if in developing countries children miss out the only meal of the day due to school closures, especially as is the case during the current coronavirus pandemic, millions of them go hungry. About 400 million children must do without regular school meals. Because of the pandemic, the lockdown has forced authorities in Africa, India, but also in Venezuela and many other countries of the world to close schools. The result? No food. Even before the coronavirus, crisis hit, 800 million people suffered from hunger. I said people, but in fact two-thirds of them are children. And these children go to bed hungry every night, and their parents don't know what to put on the table the next day. Hunger is also an obstacle to education, because children need to go to work so that their families have food. And this is how hunger and poverty are passed on from generation to generation. Without education, in turn, it is impossible to leave poverty behind. School feeding is therefore more than just providing a meal, in particular in conflict regions where 75% of the chronically undernourished children live. This is why the Ministry for Development has many projects to promote healthy diets for school children in developing countries. We are one of the major partners of the World Food Programme. The World Food Programme received the 2020 Nobel Peace Prize, and rightly so. There is far too little appreciation for what this organization is doing across the globe to combat hunger. Fighting hunger is peace policy. We at the Federal Ministry for Development have reached 1,200 schools through our cooperation since 2019, and the list could and should be much longer. But this pandemic also shows that we need a paradigm shift. Food systems worldwide must become more sustainable and equitable. It is also about the question of how much of the food that we produce ends up in dustbins rather than on plates. In the developing world, we see that up to 40% of the foodstuffs produced are lost. It is imperative to take action in the agricultural sector, in retail and consumption. Hunger must be defeated all over the world by 2030. It will now be upon us. If we want to achieve this, we know what to do, but knowledge alone is not enough. We must also take action. With the World Food Systems Summit in September, the United Nations want to advance change. And I am delighted that the topic of school feeding has been included as a separate item on the agenda of the summit. A world without hunger is possible. It is possible. We at the Federal Ministry for Development have asked experts and scientists from all fields of research, what do we need in order to make this happen? It is necessary to have the political resolve to put this subject on the very top of the international agenda. And a strong commitment is, of course, also needed. 
With 40 billion US dollars annually until 2030, we could invest in infrastructure, in agriculture, and in the food sector. And we could create a world free of hunger. Isn't this a great goal? But we must act. Everyone needs to do more. Countries, organizations, industry, science and civil society. Because it is, after all, about our future and the future of our children. I would like to thank the Federal Ministry of Food and Agriculture and my dear colleague, Julia Klöckner. We and all of you are embarking on this journey together. Thank you. Welcome back. Uh, with that, uh, we have finished the opening speeches and uh, both ministers have already laid the ground. And ladies and gentlemen, of course, uh, in the next uh, 75 minutes, we are going to talk uh, about the issues that have already been touched upon. The conversation has moved away from just uh, food and feeding, it is going uh, in the direction of nutrition. And of course, you find that uh, in the title of our conference. It's no longer about single track interventions. The focus these days is on comprehensive systems. It's about health, education, water, and of course, hygiene. And it is involving many stakeholders. And we're going to have a keynote uh, speaker. And I see her, and that's very good. Uh, you can't see her yet. Professor Dr. Leslie Drake from Imperial College London is already online. She's going to share her views and her analysis with us in a moment. But let me just give one or two words uh, on Professor Drake. Uh, you, uh, Leslie, have in the past decades not only studied and analyzed diverse pathways to establish and maintain healthy school nutrition systems. You've also worked together with many different partners in many different countries in different areas of the world. And and those people are putting these systems into place and they're making them work. So you've got a number of feathers to your head and anybody knows that we could probably go on for the next half an hour just sort of enumerating all your titles. But uh, it's important, Executive Director at Partnership for Child Development, Associate Director of the London Centre for Neglected Tropical Diseases, and I could go on and on and on. But the main and overall focus is about advancing child health and development in low and middle middle-income countries. And I know, Leslie, you have prepared around about 10 minutes with a couple of slides for us. Please take it away now. Thank you, and uh, thank you for the, the kind words. So in 10 minutes, how do I put this? Uh, my key message is that, especially now in the time of COVID, it's never been clearer than the school is an effective platform for health service delivery. It's not just about school feeding, it's about health service in general. Um, it's, and also engagement with all of the, the, the partners involved. Uh, by that, I mean the caterers, the, the teachers, the, the, the many people that provide the foods, the farmers, and all of this supply chain that seemed to have collapsed during COVID, but it didn't. And so while we tried to still feed the children, uh, it was clear that we were doing it very ad hoc and just trying to get the food out there. And the one key message for me is that the school is the platform for, for delivering food, delivering education, health hygiene education, uh, and all of the, the pieces. And I would say at the beginning of this speech that I think this is a main message and I hope we, we can come to an agreement on how we word this, but I think this should be a key thing for the Suits Food System Summit, that you know the school is a stable platform that is not going away and, and we should use it more, more, more effectively. Uh, yesterday, um, the Global Research Coalition on, on school feeding came on board about this, as did this, the Chef's Manifesto, which includes 40 of the world's most famous um, chefs. You, you probably know more than me about that. But PCD today 
part the partnership for child development uh, went on board with this and agreed to 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 um, sign up. And I'm just hoping that maybe we can have a a share on that and see how many more of our nutrition specialists can can engage with this and and uh, become on board. So. I've got two, it's just 10 minutes. So this is the key slide for me. It's about the school and it's about the school as a platform. What can we do with the schools? And, and it's never really gone away. So if you look at the bottom of the, the slide, you can see four columns, policy, safe water and sanitation, school health and nutrition services and health education. And that is the support to the children. And you can see that you know, we can provide the policies. Uh, we can provide the safe water and sanitation that was invariably not there. And also the, the services. So you can see, uh, for example, on the right hand side of this slide, um, a, a father bringing his, school, uh, his child to school to to be not just educated, but uh, being um, having the the uh, access to the health education as well, and health services as well, should I say? On the right, uh, on the left of the slide, you can see that we're growing foods. So how do we do that? How do we? In in this case, it's just about learning the kids teaching the kids how, how about nutrition. But we're trying to, what we're trying to do is engage with the, the farmers, invariably the, the, uh, the, 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 the families in terms of having a structured demand. So we want X, Y, and B uh, in terms of food to provide balanced meals to the children Monday through Friday. What we don't want to do is see that coming from uh, a parachute job from anywhere else other than the local community. So it's about forward contracting. It's about engaging with the local community. It's about how do we provide a nutritious content to the, the, the meals that are provided in schools that keep the kids in school and when they're there, they can learn. And so what I'm trying to say with this slide is that it, if, we, if we put all of these pieces together, then it really is fresh in action and we can provide health, education and nutrition to the children through the schools. And it's never been clearer to me that in this COVID environment, that, that once the school goes away, we, we, we lose that platform. And we, we, need to, we need to look at how we keep that platform alive. How do we keep that platform effective, not just in terms of education, but in terms of health and nutrition as well. And so from this slide, you can see it's, a, it's not just about the school, it's about the community, it's about the kids, it's about the parents. And using that framework that has been effectively used for a long time. Second slide. So I wanted to just show one of the things that we've been doing is a menu planner tool. This has been in collaboration with the World Bank and the World Food Programme to try and look at the nutrients that are needed to balance out what we can do in terms of a daily meal. And how, how do we do that? It's not just about providing cassava leaves. It's not just about it's not just about carbohydrates, it's about how, how do we use the local foods to provide a balanced meal. And this has been taken on. And for example, I'm, I'm sure that uh, Daniel will talk more about this in terms of Ghana, but in, in terms of, and, and we've got some, 
that we did a randomized control study in, in, in Ghana that showed significant impact where schools had school feeding in place that showed improvements in literacy, numeracy, especially in girls. Uh, but all, so we're not just talking about access, which did significantly increase. We're talking about improvements in achievement which I think is a, a key thing, and I'm hoping that Daniel will talk to that. Um, but in Nigeria, for example, where, where now the government is now reaching 10 million children per day um, with um, a hot meal, a hot lunch meal that is produced locally. So we're looking at the smallholder farmers, smallholder farmers are producing the food using this menu planner that I'm showing you now that says we need X kilos of this, we need Y kilos of that, and how, how do we forward contract for that to provide that for the children? And that's working. And 10 million kids are, are provided with a, a nutritious meal every day. And I think that's something worth looking at in terms of how we take the evidence that we have from an RCT in Ghana, we take the evidence that we have from the programmatic input in Nigeria, uh, what we have from India, and put a story together about this, the, this, the school is, is, is key to in, in not just in um, enabling education, but also enabling the community to provide a market, but also enabling the, the, the children to be fed with a nutritious meal. Um, one of the things that's happened in the last couple of days is m moving up to the Food Systems Summit is that the, the global research community the Chef's Consortium, the Chef's Manifesto, PCD amongst us, uh, uh, amongst them, have uh, are trying to put a, a global voice to this, to say, a school is the platform. This is where we should be going. This is how we can do it. Here's some examples. Here's where it's working. And I'm not just thinking about sub-Saharan Africa. I'm just talking, you know, what's happening in Scotland? What's happening in England? What's happening in Thailand? And where do we, how can we as a community put all of that together to ensure that we have the full story? Over. Okay, fine. Um, I, you had just finished. Um, I, I was still listening to you, uh, Leslie. Um, I, you, you're finished with your remarks? I think so, yeah. If you are, then, then that's fine, because we're going to have now a conversation. And ladies and gentlemen, just let me take you along on two aspects. Uh, a, Leslie was so kind as to already address one of our panelists, and I'm going to introduce them uh, very briefly and then uh, have them uh, do their first remarks at length. And uh, maybe going back to this chef's manifesto that you mentioned a couple of times, um, which um, I'm quite aware of from other contexts within the uh, uh, food and agricultural arena, and especially sort of in the run-up uh, to the UN Food Systems Summit, um, that's an initiative sort of, you know, from star um, uh, restaurateurs uh, and cooks and whatever, and they are already addressing people at a very different level. They're not saying, you know, you have to pay 300 euros a meal, um, but what we supply is nutritious food, and most of the time also food without uh, meat. Um, now, that's, of course, a different debate because, again, for the school feeding, uh, it's a very different debate, but uh, maybe it's a question of how locally, and uh, Leslie, you just pointed that out, the nutritional value of the food offered uh, is being derived at. Now, this gives me the chance to actually introduce um, all our three uh, 
panelists that I can see they're already online and I must make a compliment to two of them because they got up really, really early. So uh, let me just sort of say who the three are and I think you can already see them on the right hand side. Uh, we have uh, Robert Jenkins uh, joining us uh, from New York. Uh, so, um, you know, it's uh, coffee time in the morning. Um, he is the Chief Education Assistant Dr uh, Assessment uh, Director, Program Director of UNICEF HQ. Um, then we have uh, joining us from Brasilia, Bruno Costa, who is the Assistant to the General Coordinator for the National School Feeding Program. And you will hear in a moment uh, about the magnitude uh, of this uh, particular program. And Daniel Mamouni, uh, Catholic Relief Services Ghana, uh, is going to share uh, his view. He's built up a couple of programs and run them. And uh, he will talk about the successes and maybe also about a couple of drawbacks. So thank you very much, gentlemen, to join Leslie and me. Now, Rob, I'd like to uh, address you first, um, because uh, we know that UNICEF being one of the UN organizations that is addressing particularly the plight of children and has done so for many decades, has always had this, sort of this, this nutrition aspect. But uh, you have now, uh, since the year 2020, a new strategy, something probably changed from before, uh, that's going to take you into this decade. So it would be lovely of you to sort of lay down the red carpet and uh, share with us what made you change tech and uh, where you are right at the moment uh, with your thinking and the practice of uh, the UNICEF program. Well, thank you very much for having me. And I'm, I'm very pleased to be part of this panel and it's great to see colleagues as well. Let me start with a stark reminder. Today, schools have remained closed to 168 million children for almost an entire school year. Um, building on Leslie's comments, this has an impact across a whole range of services that children can access at school. When schools switched to remote learning approaches, one in every three children, around 463 million globally, um, were not able to access remote learning. So a lot was done and UNICEF supported uh, education systems all over the world to reach children who are no longer attending school, schools were closed. But again, one in three children were not able to access remote learning. And when I, when I use the term remote learning, I mean the radio, television, or IT-enabled digital learning, or zero-tech, no-tech solutions, such as supporting teachers to deliver learning materials. So when schools are closed, access to the full range of services is, are affected. In COVID-19 pandemic and its measure in the government measures in response to the pandemic resulted in those essential services, including school feeding and nutritional support and other forms of health support, as Leslie mentioned, were severely affected. School closures at the height of the pandemic um, affected up to 1.6 billion school-aged children. That's over 90% of the globally enrolled children. Let's just remind ourselves that the link between nutrition and learning. Good nutrition is a key investment to the future of children and their nations. Nutritious diets fuel children's growth they drive brain development, strengthen learning potential, enhance productivity in adulthood, and pave the way to more sustainable and prosperous societies. Myself working in the education sector, I recognize how critical it is while inspiring for learning outcomes and enabling every child to learn how fundamentally important nutritional support and other uh, support provided at schools plays in, that, in a child's learning journey. We have seen an increase in disparities during this time in this last 14, 15 months. Um, there were stark disparities in education prior to the pandemic, and those have been exacerbated. And malnutrition is at the heart of that disparity, because children that are malnourished, of course, cannot learn as well as children who are well-nourished. Mal malnutrition, particularly at... Um, for younger children is, is very, is, is, has, a, has a lifelong impact. And then as children move during middle childhood and adolescence, it can also have long-term physical, social, mental, and economic consequences. 
It has been estimated that during the pandemic, coverage of the essential nutrition services, like I mentioned, school meals and other supplementary uh, services that are provided at schools, um, such as uh, micronutrient support, et cetera, declined by more than 30% in low and middle income countries, having a very real impact on particularly marginalized children. So UNICEF supports the provision of nutritious school meals, working very close and in close partnership with the World Food Program and and other organizations. We feel it is part it's critical for that to be part of a broader school-based health and nutritional services. As uh, Leslie had mentioned, incorporates a range of um, of services at at school. We supported programs um, around the world that reached 244 million girls and boys to prevent stunting and other forms of malnutrition. Five million children uh, were reached to, um, with extra support to, to uh, prevent severe acute malnutrition. And um, we particularly emphasized our work and strengthened our work in emergency and humanitarian settings. Let me just summarize, let me just close up by mentioning some of the critical lessons that we've learned in twinning the delivery of school feeding with other services. We feel it's critical, particularly during this very challenging year that children and parents and we've had all over the world due to the pandemic and, and the services that were um, affected, that school feeding needs to be a part of a comprehensive range of services at school, including mental health and psychosocial support. Now, more than ever, students need the full range of supports and skills to cope with these very difficult and challenging times. We have reached over 30,000 children with such support and will continue to um, expand. Um, and lots of case studies, which I look forward to further discussing. Just to say that these challenges underscore the central role that schools play in the delivery of a full range of services. We will continue to do all we can to reach children with um, a, those uh, to provide particularly marginalized children, leveraging the school environment for to provide nutritional support and social emotional um, well-being support. Um, I, uh, thanks again for this opportunity. And I look forward to the discussion. Well, thank you very much, Rob. And uh, we'll definitely come back later on uh, after we've sort of rolled out everybody's uh, contribution. And then I'd, I'm looking forward to a lively debate. And uh, by the way, guys, uh, I only see you in a very small window. So if you want to get in uh, to the debate and if you want to uh, sort of talk to us, just give me a bit of a chance, like sort of making a decent hand movement so that I can uh, see that. Not for the next two interventions. And uh, as I'm going over uh, in the direction of Brazil. Uh, ladies and gentlemen out there, wherever you're watching us, your questions uh, to our panelists are welcome and uh, you can definitely put them in the chat. This is just a quick reminder. Now, uh, Bruno, thank you very much for joining us, getting up early as well. Um, the fascinating thing about uh, the Brazilian setup, about the National School Nutrition Program, is that it caters for more than 40 million students throughout the country, and we all know how big Brazil is. And um, the claim is, of course, offering adequate and safe food in schools. The most important thing about it, or the, the one that struck me really, is that within the stipulations that the ministry has put out for these school programs to run, you actually have set a 30% necessity of local foods, of locally sourced foodstuffs, i.e. sort of bringing in the local community as well. So that is really, really fascinating. And maybe just uh, one uh, quick word about you. Bruno Costa uh, has in implemented uh, the school food law all over the country. So um, you're the right person to answer that, how you sort of enforce that. And um, you've also worked on the ground I could also uh, enumerate a couple of other things, but Bruno, please take it away. Uh, how did you actually do that in a country like Brazil that is massive? Muito bom dia a todos. Boa tarde, boa noite, dependendo do lugar do mundo onde as pessoas estejam assistindo. No matter where you are joining us from today, hello and welcome. 
I do hope you'll understand that I will speak Portuguese. I hope this is no problem and that we will have an interpretation that it is working. Give me a sign if it doesn't work and if you prefer me to speak English. I think it works well. Good. So I will continue in Portuguese, if that's all right. Brazil indeed has an enormous responsibility in terms of school food and nutrition. The federal government, the regional governments and the municipalities are in charge. The federal or the national government has set up this program for 43 million children and students. This covers all children in the public school system in Brazil. 160,000 schools in total and 43 million students in more than 5,100 municipalities all over the country. So it is indeed a very comprehensive program. We face certain uh, problems that are very long-term wise problems. Local production is, of course, key. And the law is was adopted in 2009. It was based on three pillars. First of all, the law on sustainability and then a special budget for school feeding. And this budget had only had only been created or had to be created at the time. And of course, we needed to take money away from other sectors. And then, of course, the priorities on certain foodstuffs. And thirdly, local procurement, especially small-scale farmers got involved. So production was to be local and it had to be regular. It needed to be healthy. So it wasn't supposed to be exported from far away. So these are the three pillars that in, were to ensure the sustainability of the program. We have reached so many children in Brazil, but that depends on the social stakeholders involved. That is, of course, not enough if there is a law that is good, but we also need to have local managers at all levels of government, and these must be able to understand how local procurement works. What does that imply? Well, a large percentage of these resources is spent indeed on local procurement. And this percentage changes every now and then. It is a big country, of course, but 30% is the benchmark, and we have certain um, priority groups, for example, also indigenous groups, or quilombola, or there are those who benefit from the land use reform in terms of production. These are particularly vulnerable groups, and of course they are given priority in this program and in this procurement system. In order to make this work, the manager also must cooperate, very closely cooperate with these producers and all the stakeholders, must provide technical support, must provide funding for them to be able to produce efficiently and effectively. This is the bedrock of the program. So, there is a beginning and there's a middle part, but the program has no end in a way. This process is rather an ongoing one. It is an ongoing process of exchange between managers and those in charge and the producers and the like. For example, we have been successful in making sure that 300 indigenous groups or producers joined the program. And especially in times of pandemics, this has been 
a critical aspect for the indigenous population. It was a great support for them. They received this financial support, economic support. So it is really an ongoing work of raising awareness of integrating most vulnerable groups in our society in the system of school feeding. What is more, there is education and health. So school food and nutrition is also linked to school to nutrition and food education. So these fields are all interconnected. They are not to be viewed separately. They are all interlinked. And this is good because it can help shape eating habits and dietary habits of people. This cooperation between yeah, different parts of the country has very positive results. Our struggle against hunger was declared um, over in 2014. It was the highest priority at the time. So the problem has eased off a bit, but the program is being readjusted, revised to face new framework conditions. The problem of hunger was in a way solved and different other problems came up which needed to be solved. For example, dietary education and other aspects. Mm, now, in, at this point in time, we mainly focus again on combating hunger. The other aspects are not neglected now. No, we continue to work on them, local production and dietary education is key. $800 million per year were invested despite the pandemic. And these resources, this funding, is also expanded thanks to the regions and municipalities. What does that imply? Well, during the pandemic, too, the resources were expanded in order to live up to the expectations. And I'd now be happy to answer your questions and would like to thank you for the invitation again. Well, thank you so much. Uh, and uh, I hope everybody found the right button, uh, as I did find. Uh, thank you for uh, that sort of taking us into the framework that government can set. Uh, and uh, we're going to talk a little bit about how it filters down and how you take everybody that's teaching in the teaching area along. Uh, but not after we've heard Daniel. Uh, Daniel Mamouni, a uh, um, long biography, working uh, a lot on the ground, having worked with Leslie um, a number of years ago. So these two uh, know each other quite well. Uh, you've been working in Sierra Leone, where you've set up a, a school uh, feeding system and forget forgive the word feeding, of course, it's a nourishing system uh, with uh, a teacher training, nutrition lessons, food distribution. You're now moved on to Ghana. And uh, when Bruno said uh, the word sustainability, I know that, Daniel, that is something that reverberates uh, with you as well. Now, um, when we are talking about the practicability uh, of actually setting up a system, A, you're not, you're not starting from scratch. I mean, there's usually sort of something beforehand. So you're, you're, you're changing a running system. And then uh, you need to get on board a hell of a lot of people, not just in schools, but probably the parents, um, everybody in the local communities, uh, the farmers, etc. So you, there's actually a lot of uh, communication needed to be done. Please tell us, uh, what are the most important issues that ha you have to uh, tackle if you want to sort of get away from the feeding system to a nourishing system? 
Yeah. No, thank you so much for uh, the opportunity to participate in this workshop. And uh, I'm, I'm so glad to see uh, familiar faces, uh, particularly Leslie, who I've worked with uh, for a number of years. And um, yeah, I think uh, we're, we're really bringing this issue uh, to the fore. And uh, I think it's, it's about time that we, we figured out how to address the issue of uh, 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 nutrition, uh, particularly for uh, vulnerable communities. And uh, let me start by saying that uh, I, I currently work for the, the Cardiac Relief Service as one of the world's uh, uh, largest implementers of uh, school feeding programs. Uh, we operate in about nine countries, uh, targeting about 650,000 uh, uh, school children uh, through you know, uh, regular times and uh, also in times of uh, e emergency. So for example, with the start, uh, advent of COVID, uh, we're able to reach about uh, uh, half a mil uh, 500,000 people uh, through our take-home uh, rushing programs. And, you know, uh, I, I want to pick up from, from where Leslie was uh, talking about using the school as a platform. Uh, when, we, when we talk about school feeding, it really goes beyond just the feeding of a child. Uh, it's an opportunity for us to also address uh, bigger issues within the education sector. And, uh, you know, I've had the opportunity of working in countries that are uh, uh, looking to, you know, uh, advance, you know, uh, uh, education. You know, there, there are various reasons why school feeding is uh, implemented just beyond uh, the, the feeding. And one of the things we have seen consistently uh, and across board uh, in terms of uh, evidence is, is that it's an opportunity to uh, attract children to school. Uh, it's also an opportunity to keep them in school and it provides the opportunity for them to learn. Uh, so that instead of uh, focusing on the pangs of hunger, uh, they can actually focus on, on, on learning. And many countries in one form or the other uh, are looking to uh, implement uh, school feeding or are implementing school, school feeding programs. But we, we see that sometimes uh, uh, systems are weak or, or, or funding is weak, and you have to pick up to, to see uh, where you can uh, provide support. So for example, in Sierra Leone, where I worked for, for four years uh, on the USDA funded project uh, uh, with, with the Catholic Relief Services, the national government had the intention, uh, in fact, even started, and we've seen that also uh, in, in Nigeria, for example, uh, where the government actually started, but somewhere along the line, it, 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 it fell apart and they had to, to, to pick up. And so, you know, how do we ensure that we are picking up the pieces, building systems uh, for sustainability, and and um, you know, having coming in and 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 trying to align with the vision of the government is 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 and communities is always key uh, because people know their needs, and so uh, a first start is really looking at what are the national priorities, what is the government aiming to do, uh, what has worked and what hasn't worked, and and begin to look at. Uh, uh, context appropriate uh, models, and there are different ways of doing school feeding. Uh, you know, you have different models, uh, different supply chain systems. Uh, so assessing and understanding what works within a given context is really important. And also looking at <clears throat> uh, the stakeholders needed. Uh, you definitely need the government uh, because of the issue of sustainability uh, and, and the local communities, including parents, teachers, et cetera, and bringing everybody together uh, uh, through a process that can ensure that you're, 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 you're building an acceptable and workable uh, system within uh, these countries. And also looking at the complementary services that can keep the system going or maximize the, 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 the benefits of the school feeding program. A school feeding program that is a standalone program uh, may not provide the, the needed uh, uh, impact we're looking for, uh, but it presents an opportunity to also look at issues around uh, uh, nutrition education. So, for example, in some of these programs I've worked in, in Sierra Leone, for example, we had a, a strong nutrition uh, component where uh, we're training communities on, on the importance of nutrition, uh, looking at issues of uh, teacher training. Uh, how do you ensure that uh, teachers are trained? So we trained about 300 teachers to be certified so they could provide uh, uh, lessons to children. Looking at the complementary services, uh, water and sanitation, how do you ensure that uh, uh, kids are operating or, or uh, you know, are housed in, 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 in places where school feeding can be sustained and supported by wash services, uh, sometimes even including menstrual health hygiene, because we see that girls are not coming to school because of issues around menstrual health uh, uh, hygiene. Uh, looking at 
uh, uh, teaching learning materials that are age appropriate uh, so that the schools can have, um, uh, when kids come to school because they are attracted by uh, a school feeding, when they come in, uh, they can be given the right uh, education. Sometimes it might even require uh, uh, in the intervention design to include construction of classrooms uh, and, and other infrastructure within the school that can sustain uh, all of this. Uh, and in times of emergency, being able to respond. Uh, so for example, when uh, COVID struck and schools were, uh, cl were closed, we could even think about uh, uh, online or virtual learning in a country, a rural community like Sierra Leone. So what we did was we supported the government board radio transmitters to be able to do radio uh, programming and at the same time, provided take home rations uh, to schools. But let me wrap up by saying that uh, through it all, there are five key things that we always look, at, look out for uh, globally when we talk about sustainable or durable programs. Uh, the first one I know my colleagues have touched on, but just summarizing it, is looking at the financing. Uh, where is the money coming from? How uh, is the money going to be disbursed? And, and it sounds very simple, but it's not. Even when the money is available, how does it get to the last mile, to the end user, either be it caterers or schools? Uh, looking at the policy environment, and I'm so glad Bruno has uh, touched about the policy and the uh, uh, legislative uh, environment, because that is what will ensure sustainability and uh, uh, you know the durability of these programs. And, and within the policy realm, you're also looking at how you can promote uh, intersectoral collaboration, bringing in uh, the ministries, the various ministries that can come together, uh, looking at the design of the program, uh, what model you're going to use, the institutional capacity, training of the staff, uh, who is going to do the running of the program at the national and the subnational level. And lastly, but not the least, is how do you engage communities? Because communities, yeah. you know, at the end, if we want them to produce, if we want the food, it's coming from the community. And if you're looking for uh, community contributions, uh, we've had cases in, uh, in, in Guatemala where communities have actually, or actually donating about $250,000 per year for school feeding. So I'll stop here and uh, we can <laughs> pick up the discussion later. Thank you. Quite obviously, all your hearts are in it. So um, that's give, give a professor or give a practitioner three minutes and they'll take five. So don't worry, we still have half an hour to go. And I'd really like uh, to encourage you to have a tiny bit shorter interventions. Nevertheless, I'd like to start with Leslie again. Um, having listened to all that, uh, uh, there is one aspect if you want to have a look at what works and what doesn't work. You have to monitor and you have to evaluate. Um, how open are governments uh, to monitoring and evaluation and what can you then feed back into a system that's already running? That's a very good question. And I'll give you a very good example of where it's running very well. Well, two examples, one in, in Nigeria and one in Ghana. And the key thing is to put it into the, the policy. And so school feeding, school health and nutrition is, is, is part of the budget um, within the, the Nigerian education sector. So for example, <laughs> they need the indicators, they need them, they need to be, you know, to justify how that money is being spent. And so having that system in place i think it's more about monitoring than it is about evaluation i think it's more about how you look at how effective the program is working because if you're looking at evaluation that's a di different kettle of fish and you you need to you can do rcts and i think we, we've done that but I think now these programs need to go to scale. And if these, these programs go to scale, you need a monitoring system. You need to be able to understand the programmatic. And maybe Rob's got some suggestions because where, where they've, they've implemented large scale programs, you need to be able to see how that, how that is working. And Engaging with the government and getting the government to do it themselves as part of the, the policy drive, as part of the programmatic drive is the key way forward. It shouldn't just be about 
external influences. It should be about how can we support governments moving forward in terms of moving forward in terms of monitoring and collecting specific indicators where necessary. I don't know, Rob, if you've got anything to say on that. Thank you very much. And uh, I know that you're involved in, in all of these things, uh, which then sort of go into policy of uh, the different countries. Now, uh, Rob, please, um, uh, when you took us along the, uh, the road of uh, COVID-19 and all the inroads uh, being made uh, by COVID-19, um, I've read in, in one article that actually a lot of local communities did pick up uh, what otherwise would have been provided by schools, but certainly not enough. So. Uh, a very quick question to answer is, do you fear that that one year um, with, uh, what did you say, 1.6 uh, billion uh, kids affected is already going to make an inroad into their health? And um, can that be uh, uh, ameliorated uh, with as schools are going back to, to business and therefore providing all these services uh, to kids, um, can that be sort of uh, uh, balanced out? And then the way forward is, uh, how do we keep that community involvement? How do you keep that community involvement going? We are seeing a lot of great examples around the world of proactive action to reach marginalized children with the support they require while their schools are closed. But now as schools are reopening and recovering, um, we've, we're working very hard with, with governments all over the world to reach marginalized children, to bring them back to school. And we've seen in other uh, examples, like in the Ebola crisis in West Africa and with schools and some countries were closed for six months, one country for nine months, we um, when schools reopened, um, tens of thousands of children at that did not turn to school. It's estimated that post-pandemic, as schools are reopening, we may lose up to 24 million children not returning to school um, due to the prolonged school closure. So it's critical that we work together and proactively uh, reach marginalized children, bring, bridging them back to school. And then, like I mentioned earlier, and a number of panelists have provide the full range of support that they require, including nutritional support, school meals, psychosocial and mental health at school itself as they, as they re-enter in-person learning. Um, understanding what are those barriers that children have faced to, uh, to return to school and overcoming those, both ensuring that the school front door, the school is wide open and bridges back into school, but also um, supporting families and caregivers themselves to during after the in order for them to bridge back into school recognizing how challenging uh, this past year has been for children is is absolutely critical and some great examples around the world of where, where that's happening mm. Uh, and we, of course, know the uh, statistics by the ILO that uh, already say that the number of kids not returning to school and therefore sort of uh, going into uh, child labour in order to support uh, the families uh, is on the rise. And uh, again, that's a, something uh, that's got to be stopped and reversed because we were on a good track. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. I do already see a number of your questions uh, and I will feed them into uh, the questions that uh, I'm going to uh, put to uh, the panelists. Uh, Bruno, you were actually sort of talking about um, uh, sort of municipalities uh, taking over responsibility for running these programs. So uh, whereas I asked Leslie uh, about monitoring, the question is, you know, how much control does the central government uh, have uh, on, the, on that issue? And then also, again, the municipalities have to involve uh, not just, as I said, the children, but everybody around these uh, these kids uh, like sort of starting from the farmers to grow the right crops uh, to uh, getting the the cooks uh, sensitized uh, as to what the, and how they can provide the food uh, and then uh, of course also the parents uh, to chip in so again how do you do that okay uh bom uh, a gente nessa uh, responsabilidade compartilhada well, it's a shared responsibility. The national government provides the funds and the resources, but the rules and regulations are established by legislators. 
also with regard to the um, nutritional value, etc. And the monitoring and evaluation is also conducted by the national government at local level through the managers that I mentioned earlier. And at the end of the year, the governors and mayors need to um, be accountable for uh, their sourcing. So that the bills can be controlled at national level. There is a control body as well. Do controle social. Ele é construído na comunidade. And uh, this is stipulated in our law. Mas também vizinhos da escola. It's stipulated that parents, teachers, school directors, etc., need to be involved in uh, the whole process. So they need to be able. Um, to participate in the sourcing and production process so that they're always kept in form. At the end, there is a report that must be submitted to the national government in order to detect deficiencies or hurdles and obstacles and in order to make these public. So there's a series of stakeholders involved at a municipal level. There are school directors, school principals, um, nutritional experts who draft these uh, nutritional plants, for instance. And there's also the involvement of local producers. There are also social stakeholders within the school environment uh, parents, students, nutritional experts, as I said, producers, and these links between them and the exchange, of course, first needs to be established. So we need to connect the dots between these different stakeholders. For instance, the nutritional expert can only put something on his or her nutritional plan if he or she has talked beforehand with the local producers. So uh, this person must know what can be produced at local level. And then these persons take up, these experts take up the local crops, for instance, in their nutritional plan. Absolutely fascinating. One so, as I said, we need to mobilize all of these stakeholders. Okay, sorry, that was the translation <laughs> coming a little bit later. Um, uh, and uh, th this question also pertains uh, to Daniel. Uh, so, uh, just listen, uh, Bruno, just very quickly. Um, we have one question, very uh, special question. Um, how do you sort of look at the kitchens, i.e. sort of the kitchens where school meals are being prepared? Uh, some of the money in a not so good state. So, uh, do you actually sort of uh, put away money for that? And uh, that pertains to Daniel as well. Very briefly, Bruno, and then uh, on to Daniel. Okay. O com recurso da alimentação escolar só é permitido comprar gênero de alimentação escolar. Agora, há um outro programa dentro do Ministério da. Well, there. Of course, we can only. Um, by food with the resources uh, provided, but there's another initiative um, in order to establish kitchens and uh, equip them with the necessary equipment. So all of the meals are prepared in school kitchens by the chefs at local level, also according to their traditional recipes and methods. So the school kitchen equipment, etc., must be developed, but there is a different fund by another ministry. Thank you very much. And uh, as I said, uh, it would be lovely, Daniel, if you could keep in mind answering that. Um, very specifically, uh, you mentioned that uh, the Catholic Relief Service is working actually in nine countries uh, with a school feeding programs. Um, there's a specific question how these programs are funded. So um, I'd also like you to touch upon, so you have three <laughs> duties now, I'd also like you to uh, touch upon how do you get teachers on board? Because they somehow seem to get more responsibility than just teaching maths or, uh, in your case, probably English and uh, the local language in those uh, nine different countries. 
Yeah, no, thank you very much. I'll quickly uh, take on the, <clears throat> the question about the funding. So we are, we're funded through uh, uh, our partnership with uh, USDA, the US Department of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, Agriculture, uh, and uh, sometimes uh, through our partnership with, uh, with WFP and other actors uh, and our own internal resources. Um, in, in terms of the uh, question on the, on the kitchens, so um, there are different approaches. So uh, in, in Ghana, for example, the government actually, uh, as part of the design of the program, mandates the sub-national authority. So the district assemblies are responsible for ensuring that all the school feeding programs do have kitchens. Uh, and, uh, you know, they have designs they, they, they use. So, uh, you, you know, uh, the district assemblies are to find resources to do that. And, and they do that. Of course, you'd see different variations depending on the resource strength of the, of the district. Um, uh, in some cases, like in Sierra Leone, uh, we expected the communities, uh, based on certain models, to design the kitchens um, uh, by themselves. So that was... Uh, um, uh, done by the, the communities. In terms of the role of the teachers, indeed, teachers do have a, a significant role to play, particularly depending on the model that is being um, uh, implemented. Uh, in one setting, maybe caterers do everything. In other design models, you may have the teachers responsible for uh, coordinating uh, the purchase of the food. Uh, sometimes we have school garden activities, so uh, teachers are also uh, brought in to support uh, with the nutrition education and the school garden activities and some extracurricular activities related to, to school feeding. And they also support the monitoring of the program. Uh, and so they do have a huge, huge uh, responsibility and um, you know, uh, ensuring that they understand why they are doing this uh, and sometimes providing some incentives. So for example, we've, we've had instances where when we're giving take-home rations, we also give uh, take-home rations to teachers because uh, vulnerable uh, teachers working in vulnerable communities uh, are sometimes um, confronted with a lot of challenges, including delayed payments, or some are not even uh, qualified teachers, and so they don't have, uh, they are not on the government payroll. Yeah, over. Thank you so much. Um, uh, Leslie, there, there are a number of questions that sort of come uh, back to the, the, the Eagles view, to the academic. Um, and, and one of the questions is, and I heard Daniel sort of mention it very briefly, uh, the word school gardens. Um, because, of course, uh, we've always, or up to now in our discussion, been talking about schools uh, being sort of the platform to provide for children, which uh, is not to be put into question. However, what is the role of children? Children and are school gardens uh, and a can there be uh, a good roadway to also get to know much more about nutrition, about what everything means? Um, uh, how is the upkeep? Uh, there is the new craze, like uh, even from country, uh, from uh, areas like the Bronx, uh, where sort of uh, school and community gardens are being established in order to provide communities with more nutritious uh, and different uh, com uh, composition of foods. So what's your take on that sort of getting school children involved? I think uh, I, have a, I have a clear view on this one. Uh, I think school gardens are an education piece. And so it's about giving the, the children the opportunity to see how to grow people and also to understand the nutritional value of what they're growing. And so one of the things I, I was sharing with you earlier was the, was the, the nutrient com composition. So where do you get your protein from? Where do you get your vitamins from? And then how do you grow it? And getting the kids into the school gardens is one thing. And it's about teaching them how to grow things themselves and what are they growing. It shouldn't be about, like, that being something that the kids are engaged with to provide for the school meals program, absolutely category, categorically not. Um, and so it's an education piece and it should always be that way in my opinion. But one of the things that I was just looking up as, as we were speaking is in Nigeria, we have 100,000 cooks, 97% of them are women. And in 56,000 schools in 35 of the 36 states, 
in Nigeria. This is all domestic financing. And one of the things that I, I do really think we should be discussing is this, this aid versus development piece. And if Nigeria can put that into their domestic policy and feed 9.3 million children engaging 100,000 cooks, then maybe that's some, a model that we should be looking at. In that model, they are using school gardens uh, to, to grow a few herbs, a, a, a few spices or whatever, um, but it's much more about the education piece than anything. And I think we need to be clear about our, our thinking on school, school gardens and it being a, a learning experience, not a productivity piece. Mm. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for, for that aspect. Um, Rob, um, what we've been discussing now is sort of like, say, school centred. And of course, that's where it's happening. But there is the wider effect on the community. We've uh, heard about uh, the community profiting because they supply foodstuffs uh, into the programme. But what about the other way around, uh, like kids going home and uh, maybe coming up with a couple of ideas? that they uh, actually learned at home and therefore uh, then getting the community, i.e. their parents and their families, uh, onto a better track. Is that something, uh, Rob, that you have noticed, uh, that you're encouraging, um, that you are setting up uh, the, the pathway for? Well, absolutely. And I think what children learn and engage at school can indeed and has, and there's many examples of, uh, and great examples at scale of children um, engaging with their families, their communities after they uh, return from school. And uh, it's a partnership between schools and communities, parents, children children, teachers, et cetera, in which I think we see um, great opportunities and great movements forward. In Zimbabwe, um, just as an example, there were something called um, junior parliamentarians. They were nutrition advocates. They got involved uh, around the country in, in many different capacities, but also at community level, as you've mentioned, supporting their peers, supporting um uh, their households, their caregivers, and engaging in community uh, discussions around nutrition and healthy lifestyles and promoting um, positive behaviors when it comes to well-being more generally. Engaging also from a learning perspective, engaging with uh, students and youth and um, providing them platforms to participate as, is central to their learning, central to their well-being and contribute to community life more generally. So some great examples that are really exciting. Uh, lovely. Thank you very much, Rob. And uh, Bruno, um, I uh, just uh, did another moderation for something also to do uh, with schools and, and, and school meals. And uh, we know that a lot of uh, uh, um, middle uh, and, and, and upward moving, upward mobile countries are facing the problem uh, of obesity. Now, um, I, I'm sure that Brazil, being so diverse, uh, will have sort of at the upper end a similar problem. I I just share that one story. Uh, uh, Kazakh YouTube stars, uh, young kids, uh, 16, 17, uh, they are uh, sisters. And they say, you know, it's wonderful. We, we made an, uh, um, a uh, questionnaire in school and everybody says, oh, yeah, school meals, oh, well, uh, we don't really like them. Uh, but just outside of schools, there are these little food huts uh, where you can get uh, sweet stuff, uh, drinks, you get, get uh, sweets uh, of any kind of stuff, uh, and you can get really fatty food uh, to take away. Now, uh, how do you tackle a challenge that might well apply in Brazil as well? Uh, bom, essa é uma das principais questões uh, no Brasil hoje, é importantíssima. É, o que acontece aqui é, é muito parecido. A gente, inclusive. Well, this is a very important issue for Brazil as well. The situation is quite similar in our country, and it causes a lot of trouble for us. Lots of work. For instance, we need to establish how many people are actually involved in the school feeding programs. 
But it is also always about education on just and healthy nutrition, balanced diets. Teachers need to break up old habits um, without enforcing anything on their students. For example, the consumption of sweets. Or highly processed foods, foods that are not natural and enough. Of course, this is a huge enemy for our society, but we always need to take a balanced approach and we need to provide training and education and educate our students about nutrition and uh, healthy diets. We talked about the indigenous communities in Brazil, in, in Brazil, and these indigenous communities were integrated in schools and their school, school environments, and they introduced old recipes, traditional recipes, um, to their schools and school environments. And so schools were able to uh, reverse uh, their um, ways of dealing with food. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm quite sure that everybody else has been listening to the English version also had to wait uh, uh, until we heard uh, everything that you said. Thank you, uh, Bruno. Uh, just let me just do a little bit of time management. Um, we have 10 minutes left and I want to dedicate some of that time for like takeaways for everybody else. Um, that leaves Daniel a very brief uh, answer for you now. And I'm just going to throw one of the questions that we have coming up. Um, um, and uh, it's a question of changing the narrative. Uh, the uh, person who, who's put it is, uh, we need hands-on, skill-based, real-life food education coupled with nutritious school meals. Now, we talked about nutritious school meals, uh, but how can we change this narrative? Quick answer, a quick question. Well, I mean, I, okay. look, I think essentially we need to look at issues around taste and preferences. Uh, uh, one thing we are missing is the indigenous, utilizing indigenous foods. And so, you know, the, the work that Dr. Drake uh, explained earlier on about the Russian design tool that we, we, we developed uh, was really looking at what is available locally and how can we combine various ingredients for a nutritious meal. It doesn't mean coming with some, uh, you know, weird menus or, or things that are alien to communities. And so, I think for us to change that narrative, we have to understand that the local indigenous foods have higher nutritional values than we can imagine. Mm -hmm. But how do we combine them in, in, the, in the right quantities and in the, you know, uh, you know with, the, with the kind of right composition to arrive at uh, a nutritious standard meal for, for children? It's as simple as that. Lovely, thank you. And all four of you, you have the following task. You say one, two, three. These are the three most important issues we need to tackle that if we meet again in five years' time and talk about the same issue, the situation will have improved. Uh, I hope that I've uh, made my question clear. So maybe, Rob, uh, you start off. What are the three issues that we need to tackle most if we want to have an improvement, a fast improvement in the next five years? I think we need to scale up, number one, scale up comprehensive school health and nutrition programs around the world with a focus on marginalized children. So comprehensive, meaning social, emotional health, physical health, school health, uh, school meals, et cetera. So look comprehensively. Number two, engage with children and youth themselves with a focus on the marginalized uh, and see, um, encourage them to participate and uh, provide platforms for their engagement and to harness their energy and their ideas. And third, work in partnership, ourselves and unity. With the World Food Program, with other UN agencies, with governments, with communities, with with um, high-income governments and low-income governments, so that we have a movement to reaching marginalized children with the support they have a right to in their schools. And thanks again for this opportunity to participate. Lovely. Thank you very much, Leslie. Um, have you got your three points? I think that my, my primary point is that. 
that schools are a key platform for building back better. Mm. So how do we engage with schools? How do we engage with ministries of education in making sure that the schools are a primary focus? How, where are these missing children and how do we get the, ki- the kids back? Uh, I also think that what we mentioned before about this coalition, I think we need to engage with the countries and all of the stakeholders like ourselves, like UNICEF, like you guys, to support the coalition and come up with a formal statement about how we think we can build it back better. And I'm also thinking, I was just scribbling down while while Rob was speaking, because I think he put the nail on the head, Um, but it's it's not, you know, where are the teachers in this? Where, Where are we looking at school meals? If we're, if we're putting the kids back into school, then one, we've got that we need to push the communities to make sure that the girls and the boys are going back to school and they're getting fed. And so where is that, that, that supply chain? Where is the food coming from? Where is the nutrition coming from? Mm. We have many planners. We, we know what we can do on Monday through Friday and how is that, that supply chain being re- reinforced? Because it, it, to my mind, and other people might have different, more operational opinions, but it's we're not giving the market to to the to the farmers, which means that the first piece of, of that supply chain is not there. And so how are how are we moving to reinforce uh, the school meals in, in countries where we're trying to get the kids back into schools? We need to engage with the community and we need, need to engage with the farmer community in particular. <laughs> OK, that was a long answer for the three points. <laughs> and uh, with that, Bruno, challenge a bit faster. <laughs> OK, bom. Uh... Well, there are uh, three questions, a political decision of how to address this, and the funds that are needed for that need to be provided. And secondly, we need to articulate the different institutions, the Ministry for Health, Education, Agriculture, all of this is tackled by the law in Brazil quite well. But what is most important in Brazil is awareness raising among all social stakeholders, all those who are on site, everyone who is working there, councillors, dietary councillors, procurement experts, they all must be aware of the fact that school nutrition and food are key for making a difference, so sensitizing is key. Thank you very much. Sensitizing is key. And with that, Daniel, your three points. Yes, I, I would say, first of all, uh, let's look at how we're designing these programs. So I want to see like more improved designs. Uh, and that goes on to talk about the issue of comprehensiveness. Uh, we also have to look at the issue of uh, uh, targeting, being realistic and uh, honest that we do not have all the resources to address all the issues. So how do we target in such a way that the most vulnerable and the most in need are having access uh, to these uh, uh, to these services? Uh, and uh, you know, I, I would say let's also look at uh, uh, local solutions. Uh, maybe that will fall under the design as well in terms of uh, uh, ownership. Uh, and also improving our partnerships. And maybe let me just wrap up by saying that, you know, we really cannot fail the younger generation of, uh, of today. And so, uh, you know, let's, let's put on all the uh, actions and the concerted efforts to uh, ensure that we are not talking about the same thing 10 years down the road. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen, and also for wrapping it up really fast. Uh, so it's a big thank you uh, to the other side of the ocean, to Rob and Bruno uh, for having gotten up early and shared your absolute valuable insights with us. Uh, it's uh, uh, thank you to Leslie and Daniel, who are almost on the ti- same time zone, i.e. sort of uh, almost uh, on Berlin time zone. And uh, for that 
with that, ladies and gentlemen, with that, thank you to my panellists. Uh, thank you also to your wonderful questions uh, that we try to answer on the run. Uh, there will be now uh, an hour, a day and a half in which uh, some of you, uh, a number of uh, pre-designed experts, uh, will get together in four different uh, breakouts, in four different workshops, uh, and you're uh, always going to be sort of uh, mixed and matched, very similar to uh, what our panel uh, was about. You're going to have representatives from politics, from business, from civil society, and from science, so as to come up with really uh, interesting ideas, and we're going to have the feedback of that on Friday at 2 o'clock uh, Berlin time, so whatever time zone that might be uh, in uh, wherever you're listening us, uh, to us. Um, for everybody who's been just on the stream, that was it, and we welcome you again uh, on Friday. Also, I would like to entice you to listen because uh, we are then going to have a second panel um, talking about uh, not just the results of the workshops, but then sort of uh, saying and paving the way into the future. We'll be hearing from David Beasley, uh, the executive director of the World Food Programme. You all know the World Food Programme got the uh, Nobel Peace uh, Award last year. Well, simply because, uh, as we have also established during this particular panel, it was absolutely crucial and essential to feed not just school children, but to feed um, people all around the world that were uh, hit by COVID-19 more than others. Now, uh, the one as other aspect we're going to touch upon on Friday again is, of course, uh, the coalition uh, that has been mentioned a number of times. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, I do hope that you did enjoy the last hour and a half as a, an energetic start to this year's uh, Policies Against Hunger Conference um, and... Uh, uh, for those of you who are continuing to work, uh, the next uh, starting point will be at 2. Otherwise, uh, everybody else, see you on Friday. And that was it from our pop-up studio here in Berlin. Till then, bye-bye. <laughs>